Everybody in here has a destiny. God didn't send you here just to exist. He sent you here with a plan and a purpose. Now, many of you are in this room right now because you hit a dead spot in your life and something had to get your attention. Now, the enemy is uh, readily available to steal your attention and to try and get you to buy into a lesser quality of life. Uh, well, how many know that God has a far greater and far reaching plan to use you to reach other people? But usually you get in your own way. How do you get in your own way? Problems. Problems, situations, circumstances. Always try and thwart the plan of God to try and get you to sidetrack yourself. Ultimately, the demonic realm really wants you to take yourself out of any equation because if you can isolate yourself and blame a situation in your life, you'll never reach your destiny because you're too stuck in that one incident in your life and then you can never migrate out of it. So how many of you are sick today in this room? Raise your hand. Be honest. If you got something going on in your body, aches, pains, some kind of disease, some kind of sickness, let me tell you something. Those things are temporary. Those things are sent to try and get your attention on self so that you stop ministering to others. So your destiny is people. Everybody say people. Because people means everybody except you. Because otherwise it would be person. Amen? So you know that out of a person comes their personality. The actions relating to who they are. So the enemy wants you to focus on something that you really are not so that you become a person that isolates himself from other people. And then we overcompensate sometimes, and then we got to get attention. But that's a whole other sermon. Oh, my God, this is a tough crowd today. All right. All right, so we're going to read. Okay, you can read the narrative, all right? So what's the title for those of you taking notes? Destination Expectation. All right. So God desires that we live lives of super abundant quantity. Now, what is the number one quantity that God has provided you with? I'll tell you what you have. You have a super abundance of love. What happens is as you start living this life, uh, the enemy and circumstances in life try to get you to stop loving, especially yourself. Because there's a lot of you in this room right now. You're blaming yourself for something that happened a long time ago, and that has sidetracked you. Now, I've said this before. Energy can never be dissipated, but it can be moved. All right? So if the enemy can move you off the mark a little, way down the road, you're so far away from your destiny, you don't think you can get back on track. But that's just a device. You can get back on track instantly. Instantly. As soon as you make up your mind to say, wow, I was tricked. I was tricked. And he just moved me off the mark, and here you are, you're back on track. You know, the first order of business in getting back on track is showing up for service. That's it. Let me be honest with you. There's a lot of people in this room right now. The enemy was talking to you this morning about coming here. How do I know? Because this was your destination today. He tried to get you to go someplace else or do something else. Because this message is for you. That's why we got a lot of, to look around, there's people in here disguised as chairs. <laughs> this is the truth. They disguised as chairs. You know why? They're supposed to be here. But where are they? do anything. You know, the enemy comes and he just tries to get you to convince yourself you don't need to be here. No, everybody needs to be here. Otherwise, why would I stay up late at night for you? All right. Yeah. Anyway, I saw some of you last night while I was praying. And here you are. Praise the Lord. All right. The Word of God produces godly thoughts, healthy emotions, and wise decisions, which leads to godly actions and habits that develop into godly character. Now, like Pastor Jeff was saying, one of my pet peeves is when people use the word, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, too much. Because th what they're doing is they're th throwing out the Batman smoke screen to try and get you not to look at them clearly. Now, oh, you know that if the body of Christ is really to progress where it needs to be, everybody got to be honest with yourself. We all struggle. You guys think I struggle? Some of you think I don't. You're crazy. I struggle every day like everybody else. But the thing is, you got to get to a place in your mind where you say, you know what? I'm not going to let anything stop my destiny. My, my life, my own life, I, sometimes I wonder, how come I got to pray for, on average, between 10 and 20 people a day? All right? Now, it's my joy to do that, but some days I'm not a people person. 
oh, that's a shocker. I know. But you know what? God has a plan for every person and every pursuit that you have of God sometimes comes across the tracks of my life. And here we are. What are we doing? Well, I can tell you right now, we're here to love. And we don't question how God chooses to use us to love. Because sometimes people come across your path that are unlovable and you've got to break through those things. The only way you break through those things is with unconditional love and honesty. So in here, I, I try and be straight up with you. I just tell you straight, you're screwing it up. But don't. God has a plan. Amen. Now, if godly character is this, the prerequisite to reaching the destiny that fulfills your desires, achieves your purpose, and pleases God, then how do you get there? How are you going to accomplish this? Well, the only way you're going to accomplish anything is to empty your head of your own plan. Amen. How I many you have, have a plan every single day? Your plan is dictated. Usually when you apply for a job, your boss dictates your plan for the day. Amen. But here's the thing. Within that plan, how I many know God has another plan, a secondary plan, which is ultimately what he has you there for. Because there's no place that you go on any given day that you're not supposed to at least reach somebody with a smile. You know, people are blessed by you. If you're stuck in a closet someplace, they have pills for that. Okay. And if you're taking pills, we can get you off of those pretty quick. All right. All right. Goss pills. Ha <laughs> ha. Shut up. All right. You guys in a laughing mood? I got to start all over, man. Hand out the magic pills back there. Well, it's Halloween. You guys never get. Okay. Now, to reach your destiny, you must renew your mind. Oh, sorry, I had to let that out. We have a band that rehearses in here, and they made this thing so hot that no, I cannot move too much. Okay, so you must renew your mind with four truths, okay? Four things. Now, sometimes we do this in sermons to keep your attention because some of you are drifting. But I know I used to sit in the chairs and I would preach preacher, amen, hallelujah, and in my head is someplace else, amen, hallelujah. And sometimes you say amen and hallelujah to the wrong thing. How many of you are screwing it up? Amen, hallelujah. Oh, no, oh. all right, so pay attention. Now, all people in your notes, right, regardless of the circumstances of their birth, their life history, or current situation, have a God-ordained destiny. All of you, how many of you know that one day we leave this earth, and it doesn't matter what age you leave, how many of you know that God had a plan and a purpose just for your time here? Now, I know that the Bible says that, you know, there is a, there's time frames within that, but how many of you know that it's up to you, ultimately, what you fill your time with? Amen? So I want you to look around today and look at your name, man. See who you need to keep in prayer later today. Just look around because you got to look at faces in this life, in this ministry. You got to see faces because how I many you know that you're going to see a face? You're be like, I don't know who that is. And then six months later, that person was sitting behind you in church the whole time. And you're like, oh, that's where I saw them. Lolo. Now, I was part of a church before they used to greet you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. They hug you. They kiss you. Then they see you in the store and they're like, oh, whoa, whoa. They hide behind the cereal. Because they don't want to greet you. That's not part of their nature. That's not part of their character. Now in here, my one thing is, if you see somebody you see in church, out there, you better run to them. That's your real family. Amen? Because people let you down. And we're not that kind of people. We don't let nobody down. You're all good. Amen? All right. Look at your name and say, high five, man. We're all good. Even if we're not good, we're going to make believe we're good because we... Hallelujah. You see our security guards out here. They're all smoking cigarettes. They got your back. Hallelujah. <laughs> Some of the ladies in here no smoke cigarettes, but they're smoking from their head. They're just waiting for something. I love you that much. <laughs> you get our sense of humor now? Amen. We love people no matter what to death. Okay. Okay, so what? External influences. We're going to get to this, all right? Do not control lives. It's the information inside a person that controls his or her circumstances. Oh, well, you know that who you are on the inside dictates what you meet up with on a daily basis. Now, the world likes to call this, oh, karma. 
They like to call it, oh, this is the way of the universe. What I project out of my mind is going to happen. How many of you know these are all biblical things that somebody else has turned it around and made it sound spiritual? Now, I got news for you. The Bible been around way longer than us. Amen? And it's going to continue to be here way long after us. So the only thing in this life that you have to understand is you are here for people. So who are you? What kind of person are you? When people look at you, what do they see? Now, if you're a smiling, happy person, that's good. If you're a grouchy, mean person, oh, you know, that's not so good. So people are looking. They're watching you. You know that the Bible is inside of you. It's pre-installed software, like Windows. Some of you will get this later. In Malachi, it says that he'll open up the windows of heaven. How many know that you are a representative of heaven, so your eyes, how many know, draw people in? What you see has to meet with what you expect. So all of us in here, you have this capability of opportunity inside of you. And you with your eyes, now everybody make a mean face. Like, I mean, you know, that, that pushes people away. Unless they're crazy, then they're drawn to you. If you open your eyes, I mean, uh, that's why I, it's funny because, you know what's really funny? When we were kids, our teacher told us this. All right, we're going to make masks and you're going to have to draw a happy face on it. All right, so we all drew this happy face. We put the rubber band, happy face. And then we had to make another mask that had a mad face. And then the teacher said, okay, put on your mad face mask, everybody. And she said, smile. And you know what everybody did under the mask? They all did it with the mad face mask. So how many you know that the mask that you wear every day isn't the true you? It's whoever you're coming against or coming up with or you, you're meeting up with that makes and determines your attitude. But how many you know that if you're Christ-like, it doesn't matter because you're always smiling on the inside. It's just the outside acting. We're all acting. We're all on the grand stage of acting. And you know what? There's people out there that are missing the opportunity of meeting the real you because you're not a people person today. But inside you are. Amen. So what's your destination every day? Where do you go every day? What do you do every day? Well, no matter where you go or what you do, you still have to be the same person on the inside, and that has to be Christ-like. Amen? What is Christ-like? Christ-like doesn't say, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, and praise the Lord. How do I know? Because Jesus didn't say that in the Bible. Does that make sense to you? Do you ever read that in the Bible, that Jesus said that? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. No, he's not going to thank himself. So this is a behavior that has come into the church people that tries to get them to act their way out of stuff. Now, let me, let me ask you an honest question. How many of you ran across a person that likes to say those things all the, all the time? And yet, they look down their nose at you. Why? Because they're trying to hide themselves. Like us, we're real people, amen? If I go up to you and I say, hey, what's up? And you go, why? I know you're good. I have to investigate that. Hey, oh, what's up? Why? Because I ask him, why? 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 You see, brothers and sisters, we all know what we mean just by the facial expression. Amen? How many of you ever had this thought? Because you're local. What you looking at? <laughs> I owe you money. Yeah. What? Get look on my head. See, that's an act. Because you're not in a good mood. So your destination every, every day determine, is de should be determined by who you really are on the inside. Amen? I know all of you in here. You're all jokers by nature. Otherwise, you wouldn't be part of this church. Yeah. You have a sarcastic sense of humor. All of you. But sometimes you want to hide it because you don't want others to know that, oh, I go to church, but <laughs> if you laugh at dirty jokes, you're a character. Amen? You know why? Because you see the humor in everything. If, let me ask you this. If you see somebody fall down, your first, if your first instinct is to laugh and then check on them, then you have a real sense of humor. Okay? Because I do that all the time. When I see people trip... You know what gets me? Everybody blames the ground when they trip. Yeah. Tell the truth. How many of you ever did that? You trip and then you look at the ground. Oh, whoa, whoa, what's up? I saw this in a volleyball game yesterday. This 12-year-old boy was playing volleyball. Okay? 
He's the best player on the court. He goes up and he hits a ball in the net, and then he looks at the ground. And I'm refereeing right in front of him, and I know this boy. I say, what you looking for? I'm not wet. He go, coach. Because I used to coach him. He like, coach, leave me alone. Are you, what are you going to blame? Because he hit the ball wrong. So everybody has this tendency to blame something, somebody, some place, some circumstance. If you're a person that looks at your past and say, oh, I'm like this because back then somebody hurt me. Or if you ever investigate a new relationship and they say, how come you're so angry all the time? Oh, well, you know I've been hurt in my past. So that got to translate all the way to today. You know, everybody in a new relationship, oh, hallelujah, praise the Lord, do that. And then after time, yeah, the honest person starts emerging. And then you start picking up on these flaws that you see. And you know, if you see a lot of flaws, it's because you have a lot of flaws. Why? Because you're an expert at flaws. That's why they're not doing it well enough for you. So you got to point it out. Amen. If you're a clean freak and somebody leaves a shirt in the middle of the floor, what is your first instinct? If you have OCD. Remember, if it's not your house and you see a shirt in the floor and you're just visiting, what, is it, what happens on the inside of you? You start looking and you start thinking. In your mind, you have picked that shirt up, you have folded it, you have even maybe washed it and dried it and folded it, put it in the drawer and closed the drawer. And in your mind, you're still looking at the shirt like... <sighs> How many of you ever walk into a house and you see a picture slightly crooked? And what is your first thing when you look at the picture? And you try not to look like... <sighs> You have OCD. Why? Because somebody told you that that's wrong. I went to a guy's house. This guy is rich now. Rich, famous actor. He's rich, famous. Yeah, I went to his house. Every picture in his house is tilted slightly. Every one. Because he likes to see how many people like what he likes. So his first instinct is to watch their reaction when they walk into his house. And he does this with everybody. He has every picture tilted, either one way or the other. And then if he sees people staring at the pictures, he knows that's not a good person to have in his life because they are looking for flaws. How many of you can go home and tilt all your pictures today? <laughs> Just for see if somebody is flaw-ridden. Yeah? This guy does that on purpose. He says, I love it. You know why? Because then I know who I can work with and who I shouldn't be working with. He said, because if they're a critic of me, they will be a critic outside of me. And I can't have that in business. Everybody got to run smooth together. So his movies and all his different things, he fills it with people who are imperfect. I mean, you know, that that's a perfect example for the church. We're all imperfect, looking for perfection, but we shouldn't be looking for perfection. We should be looking for everybody because everybody has flaws. And we should all mesh together and help each other along. Now, if this rich, rich guy, if I told you his name, you'd be like, what? Yeah. Everything in his house is crooked. Even the towels in his bathroom. You know it? I know some of you Portuguese ladies. The towel's got to be just so. The hand towel got to be just so. The washcloth got to be just so. And if somebody touch them, you know they even touch them. You got to wash them all. Right? Because those towels, nobody touch. Yeah? The one behind the door on the hook, that's the one you can touch. Right? The one they rub their whole naked body with, that's the one everybody can touch. <laughs> oh, oh. This is what I do when I go into a house where all the towels are perfect. I always take the towel and I turn them over and I put the tag out. I refold them. Because when they go in the bathroom, they're like, they think they messed up. <sighs> nah, I did that to one lady one time. I said, so how's the towels in your bathroom? She was in there a while. That's her house. She said, uh, hang on, yeah. She, after I came out, she had to go check. She went inside. And I, I told her, oh, so how's the towel? She's like, what you did? Her first word to me, why? What you did? I said, nothing. She went back in again. And she said, you sucker. You put all the tags out. 
You know the tag, eh? She had them just so, so the tag is in the back, so you can't see it. I say, if you don't like tags, cut them off. She's thinking now, where my scissors? Yeah. She's not going to be fooled again. Some of you have OCD like that. This is not the church for you because, look, we all boss up, you know, everything. Look, I can point all the flaws out to you. Yeah. No, look over there. Look over here now. Some of you live. See, if I point out a flaw, we'll all notice, right? But if we become a person that doesn't point out flaws, we're more palatable to people. Because we're all messed up in a way. Tell me what house that you grew up in was perfect in every way. Most of you came from houses of dysfunction. I know I did. Had six kids in Lanakila. We were all drunken midgets growing up together, climbing furniture, swinging off of just cut little kids loose and watch what they do. They do the craziest stuff, right? Because children don't notice flaws. It's an acquired personality as you get older. Somebody tells you. And then, how many know that the church is the most flawed place that tries to appear that it has no flaws? Dude, man, everybody in here, if we go through your past, some of you have some skeletons in your closet with cobwebs. You know, like, nobody know your skeletons, right? But come on, everybody has them, amen? How many don't have a skeleton in your closet? I'd like to show you Honolulu Bridge so I can kick you right off. You lie. Everybody has a flaw, amen? All right, if you give your best, read that, you will have your best. So what is your best? To love somebody unconditionally. How hard is that? It's hard if you're a person that has a lot of flaws because the natural tendency in the world is to try and be better than somebody else. But in the church, we don't be better than somebody else. You don't see that Jesus came out and said, I'm better than all you guys, so follow me. No, he said, just come, follow me. Because he's going to be on display and he's going to just live. And I know one thing. People are naturally drawn to givers. Am I right? How many of you know some people that you would like to get to know better because they're generous? Hey, you don't like hanging around with tight people, right? So how many know that one flaw that a lot of people have in Hawaii is that they're generous with stuff but not with money? That's the truth. Why? It's because we were taught in Hawaii to save your money, hold your money, and then go to Walmart and give them all your money. Wait. All I know is if you pass by Safeway, Walmart, Target this week, how many parking spaces were readily available near the door? You know what is a good rule of thumb to do is park far away. Why? Because then they're not going to bang your car first. Second, you're going to get some exercise. Some of you are like, yeah, right, I'll park right by the door. If I can, I'll park in the door of the store. Just be generous, man. Why would you be like that, you know? Mm-hmm. Pulling into a store, uh, what, a couple weeks ago, shopping for the church. Pull into this store. This lady, she's like coming this way. There's all empty spaces, so I'm going to, I pull in. I pull in. She has her turn signal on. I know what she wants to do, but I go through that space to the other space. She blows her horn at me. Oh, you let like, you like go. Yeah. Rejection, automatic, right? Because this lady obviously is from the mainland. They're used to the burp. Oh, oh, oh. You never just blow your horn at me. Yes, Pastor Tim was about ready to toss this lady's cookies and salad at the same time. I pull into the outer space. And then she stays in her car for about 20 minutes waiting because she saw faces. Amen. I prayed for her intently as I walked through the store. Oh, you're right. No blow your horn at local people. Where you think you stay? You know what was a shock for me when I went to the Dominican Republic? Because the, the streets don't have lines. A lot of places don't have lines. So in a place like maybe Kanoilehoa like this, where there's uh, two lanes, there's six cars across. 
going down the road. And they're constantly blowing their horn. And you know what happened to me? I was like, oh, oh, oh. You know what the pastor told me? He said, you don't like that? You American? You American? I said, yeah, I'm American. He said, you. I said, more so, I'm Hawaiian. We don't blow our horn in Hawaii. So when somebody blows their horn, what is our first instinct? Oh, what, 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 what? You emphasize the T in the word what? Because we don't understand. Hey, eh? the mainland, they blow their horn because they're trying to warn you that I'm right next to you. Don't move over. Beep, beep, beep. So all the way down the highway is like that. And over here, you blow your horn, that's it. Everybody and their cousin come out. What? What? What you blowing your horn for? What? Huh? And what is the one thing they check when you go for safety check in Hawaii? Check if your horn works. But we don't use the horn. Some of you need to go and practice. Yeah, right. You know what happens in Hawaii, and I notice this. As soon as you hear a horn, everybody looks up. You know why? Because we're not used to that. In New York City, I was just there about a month ago, horns blowing all, the, all over the place. And I was getting anxiety. I was like, why are they blowing their horns? Oh, you know that this might be a character flaw inside of us. We're too laid back. We're not intense enough. But you know what it is? We need the bumper stickers. Drive aloha. Live aloha. Why? Because we understand aloha. They don't. So when we hear that kind of thing, something inside of us likes to tell us that we have a rejection issue. Amen? How many of you ever had a horn blown at you and you reacted that way? Whoa, wow. It's because there's a rejection inside of you. There's a part of you that wants to fight first. Because you think you did something wrong that you never do wrong. Did that come out right? Sort of. Well, we all need to understand that everybody is everybody. And we just got to relax. Amen. Even when it comes to church stuff. You know the sin issue, the big S-I-N, the self-induced nonsense? That is free agency. God has given you everything in this life, everything, and you got to own it. So it's not your job to call somebody else on their behavior. And that's why a lot of people are sick because they feel like they did something wrong to earn the right to be sick. And that's where the church got to step in and say, no, 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 you did nothing wrong. We just need to get that spirit off of you and out of you and then all is well in the world. Amen. So how many of you in here are suffering from some kind of a problem? I don't care what it is, mental, physical, financial, relational. That's not the only areas that are really affected in your life. If you can understand that God is not punishing you, then you're good. How can we say God is love, but then in the next sentence, God is punishing me? You can't do both because God is not like that. It says in the Word that salt water and fresh water cannot flow out of the same hole. But yet Christians always have fresh water and salt water coming out of the same hole. We need to be people of love and not call anybody on anything because we don't want nobody calling us on anything. Just look at the horn blowing techniques. If that ri raises your ire, then you should not be a person of judgment at all. At all. Amen. All right, so what is your destination? What is your destiny? I can tell you right now, your destiny is people. People are your destiny every day. How are you reacting to people? How are you helping them along? Well, you just got to accept who they are. Everybody has a past. Am I right? No, am I wrong? How many of you were born right now? Anybody? You were born like immediately, like today? No, then we all have a past. Okay. Now, look at this. Number four, order and balance are essential characteristics. Order and balance. You know what order is in your life? Not when you go McDonald's and ask for a number four or a number three. Order is when everything in your life is smooth. Balance means you're not w wavering either to the left or the right. You're just smooth. I mean, you know, that if you're that kind of person, people are attracted to you. But you've got to have the character to match when they come. Now, for me... No matter what kind of day I'm having, I just got to have a day. Amen? I just got to minister, and I just got to be there for people, and that's fine. I love it. 
I love doing what I do for people, but at the end of the day, I get exhausted. And I finally get to a place where it's just, I just need peace of mind. I don't need somebody talking to me about stuff at some point in time. Amen? So when the phone goes off, it goes off. When I wake up, I begin again. Amen? How about you? Hallelujah. You know that there's somebody on the other side of the door of your obedience out here? As soon as you become obedient. Now, if you're a person, like I asked you earlier, if you have something going on in your life that you need freedom from, how many of you know that there are people lined up that have the same disorder as you? Disorder where you have order. So once you get order, the disorder you can minister to because you came through it. Now, if you've ever been healed of anything, how many know that you carry an anointing to pray healing for that? Now, I must have, wow, if I think back to all the things that have gotten healed in this ministry, I must have had a lot of dysfunction going on in my head that I had to overcome. Because I minister to all kinds of people every single day. Yesterday I had a boy, he twisted his ankle, not even on my team. I said, come boy. And he said, uncle, um, he knows me. You know why? Because his mother was in the stands, told him, go see Coach Tim, Uncle Tim, Pastor Tim. I get three titles in the gym at the same time. Uncle, Pastor, Coach. said, go see Uncle. He can pray for your leg. So he said, Uncle. And he didn't say anything. He just looked at his leg. I said, well, I saw. And he said, Uncle. I put my hand on his head. I said, cough one time. And he coughed. And I said, now you're good. You know what he did? Okay, thank you. Gone. And you know what he said? Ma. He even yell, Ma, I'm good. I can play, right? Because his mother wasn't going to let him play if he was injured. So how many know that if a 10-year-old kid, because he was 10, can get healed? How many know that everybody in here can get healed? Everybody. I don't care what it is. It's just whatever, however deep that root is in your head just has to be plucked out and you're good. Amen? And that root goes all the way to whatever ailment you have. You just pull it right out. Man, I've ministered to almost every one of you. You know that if you believe that you got healed, that thing came out the minute you said, I gave it to God. Don't claim ownership over anything you have. Don't say my, my asthma, my that. You know, like I said before, God is not a thief and he's not going to steal anything you own. That's good news for some of you in here because that's all you needed to hear. That you don't own whatever's going on in your body. All you got to do is say, it's not mine, so I want to return it back to its rightful owner. Somebody dropped this off. If you found a wallet with $1,000, that's a bad example because some of you wouldn't return them. You say, I found your wallet. It was empty, though. <laughs> How you know it had something inside? Anyway, see, anything that's dropped off in your life, you can return it back. And that's where the church is supposed to come in and do deliverance because we just deliver it back to its rightful owner, which is hell. Amen? So I don't care what it is. Whatever you got, whatever you got is just on loan to you to see if you own it or you don't own it. You guys get that part? The doctor will help you own it. The doctor by nature is not evil. He's just there to tell you what you have. And it's up to you that what you have is temporary or permanent. Like I said before, God can never, ever heal stupidity. Insert laugh track now. Ha, 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 ha. I've got to help you guys laugh. Oh, God. God cannot fix stupid people. Religion is stupid. Everybody say it. Religion is stupid. Now, you're not calling your friends who are religious stupid. They just resemble the remark. Because religion is stupid. Stupid. Very stupid. You know why? It tries to get you to own something. You know that when you die on this earth, you own nothing? Amen? They never did hook up a U-Haul to your casket, all right? I can tell you right now, I know a, <laughs> this, this guy in Hollywood is telling me this famous actress, she was old when she died. They buried her in her Mercedes, the whole Mercedes. They dug the hole. If you go look online, you probably hear the story. This guy was telling me because he went to the funeral. He said, she was so greedy 
that if she could, she would have had all her money taken out of the bank, put it in the Mercedes, and buried the Mercedes. Here's the thing. She didn't trust nobody. She gave all her money to the Humane Society because the animals never did her wrong. I said, she never grew up on a kilo with a dog to bite you for nothing. But this lady chose to be buried in her Mercedes in the graveyard, and they covered it over. And all her jewelry is in there. I said, where that grave stay? I got to go pray for that one. And he said, no, she was so greedy. She felt like she could take it with her. That's just a waste if you think about it, right? Why not leave it, leave it to somebody to enjoy? But no, some people, their mentality is so just ownership. It's mine, mine, mine. And you experience this a lot with some people. How many of you got some people like that? They loan you something and then within five minutes, they're like, I'm back. Yeah. It's probably money, right? Or tools or something. You ladies know if you lend your friend your dress, you're probably not going to get them back. And if you do, all the seams going to be busted out of it. <laughs> I get that kind of ministry too. People come to me, pray for me. Why? Uh, why? And they go, Pastor, I will loan my friend a thing. And the thing came back and was broken. I say, you know what you should do when you loan somebody? Just gift it to them. Just don't keep them. Why? Because God will provide you another. Anything you sow out has to come back as a harvest. Does that make sense to you? So even a hammer, you loan a hammer out, you should be able to get a hammer someplace along the line. I look at things along these lines. If I have loaned somebody something, it doesn't come back. I just wait for the harvest on the back end. It doesn't matter. That one is gone. Forget it. God will provide the next. Amen? How many of you are starting to learn that kind of thing that God will give you? So if you loan your man out to a lady, <laughs> consider it a gift. And you can say, Jesus, <laughs> I get a better one coming, right? <laughs> because if you loan him, well, let's just say he left, how I many you know you're entitled to a better model? You don't ever trade in your car for an older one. Some of you ladies, you got to let go of that guy because it's still affecting the guy you with now. Hello. 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 If you treat your guy the way you treated your other guy and he left, don't be surprised if this one leaves too. <laughs> you got to change. You got to be in a constant state of change. Am I right? And same for you men. The reason they left because you never pay attention, let them go. Because you're not good at paying attention anyway. There's some men in here, you love your remote, your remote control more than your lady. You know why? As soon as the remote, because some remotes, they say on the screen, remote battery low, you're like, oh my God. If this thing don't work, I got to get up off the chair. Hey, babes, bring me on battery. You like the battery, huh? You see, here's the thing. If something has left your life, look at the reason it left. And don't repeat the mistake. Especially if you love it. Amen? Uh, I know. I've been through relationship. No, I went through one rough one. Mm, mm, mm. And nothing is wrong with me, as you can tell. I'm good. I'm perfect. Yeah, right. If you get the shakes, something wrong. Uh, how many of you went through a bad relationship experience in your past? Thank God they're not here. With you in here. Because they don't have to fix two instead of one. You guys know what I mean? <laughs> I thought that to people all the time. <laughs> Let them go. Let them go. You don't need to pick up the dirty babies now. Because they have a habit of leaving it. And like I said, that same lady with the tags, you guys remember the tags, the towels? She used to complain about her husband leaving his dirty underwear on the clean. For some reason, he didn't throw it on the floor. When he took a shower, he put it on the clean towels and jumped in the shower. She just had this thing in her head. And you know what it was? It traced back all the way to her childhood. She would get spankings for not leaving everything perfect. Everything had to be just so in case company came over. Just in case. 
And I told her, how many people come to visit you? Not many. I, I said, why is that? Let's explore this. And she started to tell me, because I don't, I don't, and she started to break down. I said, why are you breaking down? She said, because I don't let nobody come to my house because they're going to mess up my stuff. Wow. I told her, here's a strategy. Let them mess them all up. Then you get to start all over again. And she looked at me, and I well, you know that when you do ministry, sometimes people have reverted back in age all the way to their childhood. She became like a little girl who got abused for not having everything perfect. And I told her, just let them all mess them up. Then you can start all over. And then she started to get a new outlook on life. And she says, that's right. That's right. I get to start over again. I said, because that's the key to everything Christ-like is you get the ability to start over every day. The Bible says His mercies are new every morning. Everybody say every morning. Because every day is a new day in God for you to start over. Yesterday, according to the Bible, is dead and gone. But what is the enemy's strategy? To take you yesterday, make it your today, and also have your today be fearful of its tomorrow. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 6, to only worry about today. Does that make sense for some of you in here? Enjoy who you're with today because tomorrow they might be down the road or on loan to somebody else. You know that the number, the number one thing that women go through is relationships, not with men, with their friends when their friend chooses another friend. They get all boss up. Like, you know what? I didn't mean, walk her through all that, and then now she with my enemy. Wow, look at what she had to deal with. Anyway, I don't say that, I just think it sometimes. But it gives me room to minister, amen? Man, they could care less. Hey, what are you guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I don't like go. I like watch TV. They don't care. Ladies, they get all intertwined because ladies are all about the journey, not the mission. Amen? So for us in here, what's the expectation in anything you do? is to be satisfied with being yourself. And sometimes you're alone by yourself. You need to enjoy yourself. Amen? Because if people drive you crazy, don't let them in your life. But if you're getting crazy when nobody's in your life, something wrong. You cannot have it both ways and be crazy at the same time. Okay? Be happy. Amen? High five your neighbor and say, you happy? Yeah. And if you're all by yourself, high five the air. Say, yeah, I'm by myself again. Woo! Hallelujah. All right. Comfort zones. Let's look at that in section B here. You must be willing to leave your comfort zone and step out on divine ideas to reach your destiny. You know that God has these ideas that He floats through you because you have the gift to accomplish it, but more often than not, you're looking for somebody else to do it, and then you hang on with them. And then while you're hanging on and they accomplish it, then all of a sudden you want to take the credit for the idea that you had in the first place that you never do. Wait a minute. Something wrong with that. That's happened to me a lot of times. The idea comes to me, and I say, mm, that's good. And I tell somebody about it, and then they go do them. And then they come back and ask my help to bail them out of the idea that I gave them, that they stole. And then, hallelujah. You see how all of this stuff just gets nuts after a while? You know, if it's your idea, follow it through to the end. Amen? We're doing a thing like that right now. We're trying to get other people involved with an idea that the church is trying to do. And you know what? All of us get to own it. Even though it's my idea, I'm responsible. So I just got to make sure everything is clean on the back end. Once we accomplish the thing, then we can all take credit. Amen? Some of you are like, what? If you weren't here Wednesday, your fault. Okay. Read number one here. A selfish idea. Read that out loud. Go ahead. A selfish idea, one that only benefits you, is not a God idea. All right? And how many of you know that anything that you have in this idea pattern that you have structured in your life has to benefit others? Because God has put you in the people business. You don't think you come to church and hope the church is empty, right? Look around you. There's a lot of people in here. We're all here together. We all came through something hard. That's why God brought you here. Now, I look at other churches and we do, believe it or not, I get 
the majority of my calls, I'm not going to say the church name, the majority of the ministry calls I get are from three different churches in this town that are supposedly the largest churches in Hilo. They call us for help. Now, the reason they call us is because this is the number one reason they use is because I don't want my church finding out that I'm asking for help. Think about that. Let that sink into you. Why can't they go to their church? Here's a secondary reason. They have gone to their church and their church has told them that what they're going through is nothing. Oh, you know that whatever you're going through is important to God because it's in the way of something bigger about to happen in your life. And you come to that realization that this thing is blocking me. I need help. Oh, you know, nobody's supposed to judge you on the help you seek. Amen? So a lot of uh, the calls that we get are from other churches, and they come, and it's our pleasure to minister to them. And the one good thing, boys and girls, is this. I wasn't gifted with the greatest ministry in the world. I was gifted with a ministry, but what, what has happened over the years is all the ones that nobody wanted to help have graced my door. And you know what's happened? I have gotten to the point where I have had so much practice, so much practice that I'm good at what I do now. And I'm only good at it because other people didn't want to do it. So when I see somebody get healed of cancer, how many of you know that's important, yeah? But when I see somebody get healed of depression, that's just as important. I've gotten so good at these things. It's because nobody wants to do it, so we do it, and we get the greatest results, and then they're jealous of us. That doesn't even make sense. You guys had every opportunity to do it. Now, it's gotten to the point where this morning I got an invitation online to come to Honolulu to participate in a secret Bible study at one of the biggest churches in Honolulu next, uh, this coming Friday and Saturday. They want me to come and speak to the leadership. Secret. Why is it a secret? Because they don't want the top guys knowing that they're coming to this church. You know, a church is not based on the size of the congregation. It's based on the size of the congregation inside of you, rooting you on. Uh, we got the great cloud of witnesses backing us up in heaven. You know, you guys are all a testament to success in ministry. If you're still going through something, hang on. It's about to break through for you. It's about to disappear from your life. I don't care what it is, it's about to disappear in your life. If it's depression, it's about to disappear in your life. If it's cancer, it's about to disappear in your life. If it's about poverty, it's about to disappear in your life. It doesn't matter what you're going through because you're going through it, not to it. Because going to it would make that your destiny and your destination. But you're going through it because there's a far greater life on the other side of that with many more people to come to get ministry from you on the back side. You got to realize that your life is a seed that God sowed into the earth to grow a harvest. Okay, I was waiting for that. How about more of you say amen? Okay, thank you. Uh, talking for my health? Okay. okay. All right, look at number two. This is just an, uh, an analogy, right? Never quit a job to get a job. Amen. I mean, you did that before. Quit a job, you get another job. You're the same person. No matter what job, you're still miserable. Why? Because we're all wage slaves at that point. We all got to show up for the paycheck. So we're a slave to the wages. So we got to show up and do what's required of us to get the paycheck. Now, how many of you feel like you are worth more than you get paid in your job? Yeah? Then God has a greater idea for you. Hang on. All right? Read the rest of this now. This is especially true for men. Instead of always support your family and provide stability while pursuing your entrepreneurial goals. If you have a far greater and far reaching idea on the backside of what you're doing now, then keep this for now, but God has another plan for you. And you know what the number one entrepreneurial goal that has never been really fulfilled is a Christian doing ministry and making a living at it. Hmm, interesting. But a lot of people don't look at that. They look at the church as always being needy instead of being giving. Think about it because, you know, I was 17 years old when I started my first business. 17. It was the summer right after I graduated high school. I was still 17, and I started my first business. I was able to parlay that into a lot of income. And, you know, I had a lot of mentors along the way, 
And here's the one thing about local people. Don't ever look at your mentor as being mental. Amen. Because if you look at your mentor as being mental, you never receive what you need to receive from them in the life lesson you're about to get. So I always looked at the value of each and every person, and I learned something along the way about people. You know, I was 15, and I was doing peer counseling in high school. I was 10th grade. They, they, I got hired as a part-time job after school on Wailuku Drive, which is on right by Hilo Union School and Easter Seals, right in that area. I was doing drug peer counseling at 15. And I asked the guy, why did you choose me for this? He said, because you're the only kid not on drugs. Huh? He said, I chose you because you're not on drugs, and you can represent something. So my life has already been an example from when I was 15. Now, am I the greatest example? Heck no. Heck no. Because i got a lot of flaws going on in my head as well. But here's the thing. I had to be there for other kids. And all I had to do was talk story with them. That's all he said was, all you do after school when it's not sports season, you come here, I pay you. And it was $2.60 an hour. You guys remember those days? Two sixty-five, I think, was the minimum wage, and I was getting paid that to sit there and talk story. I thought that was the greatest money I ever made in my life. Who would who wouldn't want to get paid to talk story? I just talk story with guys, and you know what we found was a lot of people like to hang out and wanted because I was a good athlete, they wanted to copy that. So we just talk story, and then we go shoot baskets or do whatever we do, and people would get healed. So. Oh, you know that there are ways to make money outside of your personal vocation you're in right now. You know the number one thing that people don't leave a job for in Hawaii? Benefits. Benefits. That's what you look for in a job. Benefits. But is it benefiting God's kingdom? Huh? Well, that's something you got to think about. If you're in a job and you're reaching a lot of people because of who you are in God then the benefit far outweighs what's going on in your paycheck. Amen? So you just got to look at all of these things because some of you are called to ministry, but you never even thought about that. You know, you, man, uh, I got to work. I get state job. I get county job. I get, I get paid. I get benefits, federal. I get my company get good medical and retirement. Well, those things are all important, but how many people are being actively reached? You know, how do you reach somebody? I'm going to tell you right now, it's not religion. Again, it's love. How many people do you get to love every day? That's how you weigh your life. If you get to love somebody today that wasn't lovable or never experienced love, then you accomplish your mission for the day. Amen? was me. I just go around. Wherever people call, I just show up. You know, Lana Kila call me. I go there. Minister. Hey, they're happy. I'm happy. We're all happy. It creates a better atmosphere in the community. That's it. So I've been to a lot of your houses, and some of you know invite because you tight, or you know, like me, turn your tags around on your towel. Okay. Look at C. God knew you and predetermined your specific purpose before you were conceived in your mother's womb. That's in Jeremiah. That God knew you before you even were a speck in your father's eye. When your father was out doing his dirties, God knew you. And you know what? If we had to pre-select our parents on earth... Most of us wouldn't pick the ones we ended up with. Am I right or am I wrong? Or what if it's reversed and we say we did pick the ones that we went because we felt like we could accomplish coming through that. You know, you can look at it both ways. If God has a real predetermined plan, how you know that if we're all in heaven before and looking down and saying, I can conquer that family right there. I can go through that family and conquer that. Well, you know that it's God's great pleasure to say, go ahead and come home safe. Think about your family now. Uh-oh. Uh, I know my family got a lot of problems. But you know what? It's it. That's, it is what it is. It is what it is. You come through that. How many know that you got to find your peace in your church family? How many of you have found peace in this church family where there was no peace in another church family? If you haven't found it yet in here, then you got flaws that we got to work on. Amen? You know what your flaw is? You're untouchable and unreachable. <laughs> if you have a helmet of religion on, this is going to be a hard church for you because over here, we need everything you are and everything you get. Because we care about you, so we say, hey, what's up? What's up? Come on. 
And you know, in here, anybody in here will pray with you anytime you want. Why? Because that's an extension of who we are as a church. We'll pray for anybody, anytime. Am I right or am I wrong? Some of you want to do it, but you don't know how. Like I told you guys before, Jesus said, pray to God in Jesus' name. Anything you put in that Oreo cookie in the middle is all gravy. It's all good. God will answer that prayer. I've seen people come and sit in a sermon like this and walk out the same day and call me up within a couple hours and say, Pastor, I pray for somebody and they got healed. And that's a surprise to you? It's a surprise because it was the first time they ever did it. So I got news for you. A lot of you in here, go pray for somebody. I don't know how. No, you know what's stopping you? Courage. That's it. Courage. Just have courage. Why? Because you're an extension of us. Amen. All us in here, we all good. Amen. Are you all good or you all bad? Oh, yeah, you all good. All right. So if God knew you before you came, how you know that He knows you while you're here? Don't ever ask God, God, where are you? How come, God? How come? Well, how come is because how come? Amen? All right. So God set you aside for a time period in which you were born so that you could be a part of his plan for this generation. You know that you could have lived any time in the sphere of time and space? How many of you want to go back and live in the 1200s? No, hot water. You got to go boil them in a pot, a big pot. How many of you want to go back in time and go do that? Not me. How many of you enjoy at the end of the day, you can turn on the hot water and it's there? Yeah. Back in the day, you couldn't bathe for weeks and months sometimes. How many of you want to go back to that? Life expect- expectancy was in the 30s. Some of you would be long gone by now. But God has chosen for you to live now, and here you are. Are you happy? If you're not happy, something wrong. We've got to fix that. All right. Number two here, never determine your own purpose. Discover the set path and race that God has already planned for you. You just got to find out why, he, why you are in this life and who you're reaching on a daily basis. Now, if you're in retirement mode, then you know where everybody goes when they retire in Hilo? Where they go? McDonald's. And bring your bento to McDonald's. I don't know why they do that. <laughs> we used to, when we first started the church, we were in downtown. We used to go cage driving because the church was right next door. And we used to go to cage driving, see the same people there every single day. And we used to start to talk to them about God. And be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know God. And they had cage driving with food from home. They buy the coffee because it was cheap. Then you go to McDonald's, we used to go there. And they would have bentos in McDonald's because the coffee was cheap. And we would go to the bowling alley, and they would bring food in the bowling alley and eat, and, and eat their food and drink the coffee because it's cheap. So evidently, the key to ministry is cheap coffee. I got news for you. If you retire, just carry one thermos with you and walk around and tell people, hey, you like coffee. Oh, you have a captive audience because it's free coffee. I tell you, the key to ministry is giving somebody something that they value. Hallelujah. Think about it now. What is it that you have an abundance of that people need? Hmm. I got news for you. It's probably love. Because the coffee is just a byproduct of who you really are. Amen. You can go down a beach. Right? What are they looking for down a beach? <laughs> She knows that's her her and Arnold's office down there. Hey, whatever it is, you provide it, they'll show up. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, it was good yesterday at the volleyball tournament. They gave me a bag of candy. And I told the kids, oh, they gave you guys candy. They go, we don't need candy. It was just Halloween last week. So that's a news flash. Don't give somebody they already have something of. Just... But if they're handing out dollar bills to the kids, they'd be like, oh. yeah. So offer something that people don't have. So that's the key to ministry. What is it that people don't have? I'll tell you what people in Hilo don't have. Unconditional love. How many of you have an abundance of unconditional love? All right. So you know how you use your unconditional love? Take away your conditions. Stop worrying about yourself and go out and pass this out. Once you do that, hey. The joy starts to flow. Amen. 
All right, life sequence, following the life sequence by using the word to shape your thoughts, emotions, decisions, habits, or actions, and character will guide you to the set destiny that God has for your life. All you got to do is understand why you're here. Why are you here? All of you can live someplace else in the world. Where are you? Hilo. And what you complain about in Hilo the most? The rain. What is the second biggest complaint about Hilo? The people. Oh! Evidently, you like rain and people. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Nobody is trapped, right? This is not a communist state. Nobody's holding you here at gunpoint that you got to live in Hilo, right? You know what is the funniest thing? People like to drive to Kona for vacation. And then they grumble about the traffic on the way to the vacation. Then they go on the vacation and they grumble about all the tourists. I think people in Hilo, their number one love is grumbling. That's just a thought that I have. I, am I right or am I wrong? There's people in Hilo just love to grumble. Grumble, grumble, grumble. Because no matter where you go, any line you stand in, any supermarket, any store, you will hear people say it. Grumbling. About what? Other people. You know, last week I was at Kamehameha School. We were coaching a volleyball tournament there. We went down to Foodland in KL. And the lines were long. And there was a sign up there that says, We end long lines. And the lines were long. <laughs> and I'm listening to these people go, End long lines? More like should be start long lines. And I guess they have a number of open lines in the store. It tells you how many lines are open, how long they've been open. And I'm, I'm like, oh, my God. And this lady's like, oh, my God. You know what's so irritating is that we got to come and we're captive to this one store because that's the only store in all of And we got to come. And we're, ah, ah, ah. What, four miles down the road, there's many more stores. Hallelujah. One time I was at Safeway. And they got like 18 or 20 checkouts, but only four people working. And I say, if there's anybody that should grumble is if you go Safeway. Because they have the capability to open more, but they don't. They let you line up, right? And the thing is, you can also go self-checkout. And people are grumbling. Ah, oh, look at that self-checkout. All these self-checkout people are just checking out themselves. No matter where you go, people are going to grumble, right? $5 Friday at Safeway, what do they grumble about the most? The chicken. The chicken. They fight over chicken. You're going to wait. They tell you 30 minutes and one hour, you're going to wait for chicken. Is there a rule that you can only eat chicken on Fridays? Evidently, in your mind, there's poverty here. Because on a regular day, how much is the chicken? Like eight dollars, seven ninety nine, eight nine, something like that. But you gotta go on Friday because Friday is four dollars. Uh, why would you grumble when you, man? You just fall in prey to a trap, a scheme. They got you programmed to have to have this five dollar chicken. That's not even the best deal on fried chicken in Hilo. You guys know that, right? The best one is running in your yard for free. <laughs> God has given you chickens for free. One eight piece running around your yard. Yeah. I know my Filipino grandpa would be in heaven. <sighs> I the chickens we can cook them right now. That was my first experience. I was four years old. My grandpa said, here, hold this chicken. And I'm four, like, yeah, I get to hold the chicken. And he grabs the head and cuts the head right off. And I'm like, ah, ah. And this thing is like blowing blood. Ah. And he said, let him go, boy. Let him go. And the chicken's running around. He's like, ah, ha, ha, ha. chicken without the head. Ah, ha, ha.
And he said, look the chicken talking to you. Ah, bak, 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 bak. I am white, Grandpa. You know what my dad said? My dad's a redneck from the mainland, yeah? And you know what dad was saying at the time? He said, hey, we did the same thing when we were kids. So evidently, chickens are running around for free. All you got to do is grab them and cook them. And the good part is you're not captive to only fried chicken. Can eat everything because my grandpa ate the feet too. And he ate all the insides. Mm. They even cut the comb off the chicken and they cooked that. And to this day, I only like fried chicken, so I'm stuck on Fridays too. I gotta go. <laughs> the Shell Station on Kawailani, guys. Three piece with two wedges, three twenty nine. Don't go there if I'm there. We're going to fight. Two drumsticks and a tie and two potato wedges for three twenty nine. Best deal in Hilo. You guys don't know where that is, right? Good. No. Right across Andrew's gym. Telling you right now. Best deal in Hilo. You don't need to go fight all of Friday and stand in the line and grumble. No, 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 chicken, no, no, chicken, 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 chicken. Shut your mouth. Go someplace else. Hallelujah. The best out of deal, 20 piece chicken McNuggets, five bucks. You guys know where that is because I said McNuggets. See, everybody has a grumble, but there's a solution to every grumble that you can put out. Am I right? No matter what, there's always a solution somewhere to fix your problem. You know, the church is your solution for grumbling. But what did people just think about churches, church people? People in church, the number one thing they're experts at is grumbling. You know the number one thing they grumble about? Somebody in my chair. Second thing they grumble about? The church only like my money. The third thing they grumble about? They're all looking at me. <laughs> what else can people church, uh, church people grumble about? Think about it because it's going through your mind. It's so hot in there. You know, our church before was air conditioned. You know, people who grumble about too cold in there. Too cold, too hot. People looking at me. They only like my money. The sermon too long. The pastor don't know what he's talking about. Huh? That's really one of the big ones, too. He, he knew all my business and he was only talking to me. You know, there's a lot of me's in here yeah, right now. How many me's in here? Everybody who's a me, raise your hand. Yeah, me, 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 me. So I, evidently you're not alone talking to everybody. You know who I really am talking to is whoever's listening to this online. If you get touched by this sermon, hey, that was for you. That was good. Behavior modification without me telling you that it was a sin. Yeah, because churches have become experts at preaching sin and death when Jesus came to abolish sin and fulfill the law, thereby eliminating the penalty of sin. But churches want to preach sin. Something is wrong mentally in the church because we got to call people on stuff that they've already been set free from. I find that kind of ironic that Jesus went through all of that and we're still talking about something he already paid for and got rid of and we're still using it as a reason to keep people scared and in the pews. I think that's crazy, don't you? How many of you like that you're forgiven? Come on, you got to love it. I'm forgiven. How many of you like that when you pass from this earth, there's no judgment because Jesus paid for it all? So that leaves you with the life that you choose, and all you got to do is choose things that bring you more life. Amen? Fried chicken is good, but not three meals a day. But can you eat fried chicken three meals a day? Yeah. But is it good for you? Yeah. How about you ladies? You like chocolate? Yeah. When do you like it most? But you're not going to eat it 24 hours a day. Am I right? I know kids, they like Simon. But you're going to eat Simon every meal for your whole life? No. 
not going to make sense, right? So everything has to have order and balance. And, you know, good church has to have order and balance. You know what that is? That we love without the expectation of being loved. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. Amen? Everybody good? Hallelujah. I, I don't know about you, but I don't like people telling me how to live. Amen? Because when they tell me how to live, I do it the opposite just to show them that they're not in charge of me. I do it to show them, you're not the boss of me. Because I get people every day tell me, you know, Pastor Tim, you know what you should do? Not listen to you. Because that's what I'm about to do. And whatever you suggest to me, I'm going to do the opposite anyway. Because I'm going to show you that you're wrong and I'm right and you're not the boss of me. Because we're all little kids at heart. Amen. We all have this rebellious streak in us. All right. And then when we screw it all up, then we come back. What do you think I should do? But we want to do it on our terms. We don't want people throwing their will on us. And that's what the church does. tries to throw its will on you and hope that you live that way. That's craziness, isn't it? When we're all given free agency. You know that in the Garden of Eden, if you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, okay? And this is where it all begins, right? God says, all of this is yours. There's only one tree in there that you shouldn't eat from. And he tells them, don't eat of this tree. Okay, just, it's not good for you. But were they barred from eating from the tree? God suggested to them, don't. And what did they do? They didn't. They didn't eat from the tree. They, w- they waited. What happened is another voice came to break them down over time. How many know that this is the voice of religion? This is religion all the way in the Garden of Eden coming and telling them, because that's what church people love to do. You shouldn't do that. because, And if you do that, and Satan comes, right? He comes in a way, he suggests to them that, and he uses the word, you won't surely die, meaning you won't. You won't die in body form. You won't die spiritually. He, he was telling them that you're not going to die in a way that's going to hurt you. In fact, he harps on their free agency and he says, God has given you all of this. You're not going to surely die if you eat of it. Which is, he, he always takes the truth. He just distorts it just enough to move you off the mark. And this is where the first case of mistaken identity comes in. Because Eve doesn't yet know her identity. She's looking to Adam for an identity. And Adam has been given an identity. All he got to do is live up to it. And he's trying to figure himself out. And Eve has no clue who she is. So the enemy tries this thing, the domino principle. And what happens is all it did was create this image of right and wrong. And this is where the church now has inserted itself And that's what you saw last Sunday, that mob mentality likes to fight for one way or the other. But both ways are wrong because there's no love at the base. Love is obedient. That's it. Now, all of you in here, you have been hurt by some kind of uh, love issue in your life. And that's lent itself to rejection. And this is where all of your problems begin and end. If you can go back to an episode in your life where you felt rejected, you can fix every problem in your whole life from that moment on. It always traces back to your childhood. Somewhere in your childhood, you felt rejected. And if you can fix that in your mind, you can't go back and fix it physically, but you can go back and fix it spiritually and mentally. If you can get those two things in agreement, your words will change. Because everything to do with the enemy is always mental. Everything to do with God is, say it, spiritual. If you can get these two to find its right perspective, when Jesus talks about mountains, he's talking about mindsets. If you can shift this thing, remember now Jesus said, if you will speak to this mountain and it'll be cast into the sea. Speak to that mountain and cast it. How you know that now it's cast into the sea of forgetfulness because now your spirit comes back to its rightful place. And that's all that has to happen. Jesus gave you the whole answer is 
Move the mountain, the mindset, under your spiritual nature. Once you do that, and you have a spiritual mindset over all things, all of your problems are fixed. Every single issue in your life is powerless now. If you can get the spirit to take over the mental, you win every battle. Some of you have gotten some tremendous help from this ministry, all because we put your mindset or your mountain in proper perspective to spiritual things. Because let me tell you something. Jesus paid the penalty on the cross, and it was good. Because what it did was it forgave everything. And if you study the Word, everything from Adam all the way to us has been forgiven. You have been set free once and for all, according to Paul's writings. Everything has been paid for. So for the church to go and start preaching to people about sin and death is the enemy's ultimate weapon to get people off of their freedom because freedom is unconditional. I don't know if you're catching this, but the enemy has used the church as an enemy against itself. Mm. Think about that for a second. Or as my dad would say, put that in your pipe and smoke it. That was my dad's famous line. Put that in your pipe and smoke that. Because the church has made a drastic error. And the enemy has found it to be a comedy of errors. Because he's gotten the church to turn on itself and devour itself. Your Pastor Jeff talk about the devourer. Hallelujah. In your giving, you rebuke the devourer. That means that in your giving, you have come against the very person that tries to devour yourself, which is your mind. Your mind tries to devour your entire being. Why? Because your mind tries to remind you that you still got to live on this earth and there's all kind of problems that you got to struggle through. Let me tell you something. When you pass on this earth, there is no struggle anymore. So you got to have a heavenly mindset to be healthy because your worldly mindset will always try and tell you and remind you of the drastic, dire circumstances you're in. When Jesus has afforded you the luxury of having the greatest life possible because you are already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The enemy just wants the church to turn on itself and try and make it seem like they're not uh, gaining ground. The truth is we're not here to gain ground. We've already gained a heavenly perspective over everything in our life. If you're hearing me today, God is good. He's not some... Uh, like I say all the time, God, God is not trying to hammer you down and punish you for bad behavior in your life. You already do that yourself by punishing yourself in your mind, by telling yourself how bad you were. How many of you were bad before? Hey, you can trace it. Oh, I was, oh, I was rotten. I was pee law before. Um, you're still the same. The only thing is you learn not to do those things because you found out it was a great waste of time. Am I right or am I wrong? <laughs> if you've ever been to prison, you found out what a great waste of time really is. You sitting in jail is a great waste of time because in there, you're thinking about all the things you could be doing, would be doing, and should be doing. That is the greatest enemy of the church, the woulda, coulda, and shoulda. Because you have today. Can you? Will you? Then go do it. Amen. I want to stop here because... I think I've kind of driven home the point to you. I don't I don't think it will continue